Afternoon everybody. Movie review time. They Shall Not Grow Old. Peter Jackson's film of the First World War. What's it like? Is it any good? Should you spend your money? Stick around and you'll find out. Uh, by the way, if you enjoy these little videos of mine, you can press the subscribe button, which is down below, but not if you're watching it on your TV. And that will inform you every time I upload a new video. And if you like it, you can click the, th you can click the thumbs up sign. And if you don't like it, you can click the thumbs down sign. But I have to advise you that the thumbs down button doesn't work. So sorry about that. The other thing is that I have recently discovered that nobody watches YouTube videos anymore. Everybody now is into podcasts. So yes, Julian is going to start doing a podcast. So stick around and you'll find out about the podcasts. Anyway, they shall not grow old. What's it like? Well, let me say first of all that this film is an unqualified masterpiece. And it's not often that I talk about a film in these videos and I don't slag it off. But this one I'm not going to slag off because it is a work of breathtaking uh, achievement, innovation, power. Uh, it is moving. It is informative. The whole experience is glorious from start to finish. Now, what makes it so special? Well, there's a couple of reasons. And I think the two key reasons for me is, first of all, Peter Jackson's vision in terms of uh, thinking and deciding about what he wanted to do and how he wanted to do it. And secondly, the technological mastery that he has employed in bringing his vision to life. So what has he done? Well, he has taken uh, actual First World War film footage, and you'll be familiar with the footage from having seen it on, on documentaries or Charlie Chaplin films. Films from that era are jerky, they are shaky, the light can be all wrong, um, there is no sound, obviously, and they move at a different speed from modern films. So you can always tell it's an old film. And to a certain extent, this gets in the way of your enjoyment. You're, you're distracted by the quality of the film. And this, uh, to a certain extent, prevents you from fully experiencing what the filmmaker wanted you to experience when they first made it over 100 years ago. So what Peter Jackson and his team have done is taken uh, large amounts of this footage and they have uh, smoothed it out. They have cleaned it up. They have made it as if it is a modern day print. And then they have colorized it. Now, uh, colorization is something that has been done to some black and white films in the past and, and one doubts the, the value of doing it. But the value in doing it here is first of all you see the First World War in colour which you haven't seen before because these uh, films were made in black and white. And it brings the film to life in a way that again you haven't seen before. The colorization is done very sympathetically. It's done very cleverly. Um, I, I don't know enough about the technology to explain what it's done, but the, uh, the dirt looks like dirt. It's brown. The uniforms are the color of uniforms. People's hair color is the color of hair. hair. Their eyes are the color of eyes. In other words, the color is natural. It's not uh, technicolor, it's not over the top, it doesn't look like a Disney film, they haven't ruined it. It looks natural, it looks as if you were seeing a film from 1915 but made with modern day techniques. And then Peter Jackson has married this film to the voices of ex 
soldiers speaking. So there is no uh, narration, there is no third party explanation of what you are seeing. What he has done is, is use the voices and gain the technological achievement in uh, listening to the many thousands of hours of tape of uh, ex-soldiers speaking and then finding a piece of film that matches what they are saying and then bringing the two together. So it sounds as if the ex-soldiers are doing the narration of the actual film, although of course they're not. Now, it's not a film that seeks to tell the story of the First World War, uh, and there is nothing about the uh, First World War other than from the front line on the Western Front. There is, there is nothing of, of Palestine, there is nothing of the uh, Italian Front, there is nothing of the Russian Front, there, there is nothing, nothing of that. And it focuses almost exclusively on the British experience, not quite ex uh, uh, completely. There, there are some uh, Canadian, some uh, Australian, some New Zealand voices, but the overwhelming majority of voices are uh, British voices. And the film uh, charts the experience of soldiers on the front line uh, experiencing life in the trenches, building trenches, explaining how they operated, uh, and then showing the bombardment, and then showing uh, a, a sequence where the soldiers go over the top. So it, it focuses on a small, a small section, but in this microcosm, if you like, it, it tells the story of the war from the experience of the people who were there. Now, once the soldiers go over the top uh, and you'll uh, understand or appreciate that there is no actual film of soldiers fighting the Germans in the trenches. How, how could there be? Uh, so what Jackson has done is used still images from uh, War Illustrated, which was a magazine produced during the time of the First World War with uh, illustrations, very good illustrations, and used those illustrations during that particular sequence when he wanted to show the fighting in, in the trenches. But the voices of the soldiers are still there on the soundtrack. And uh, it, it works. It works wonderfully. Uh, and I saw it on the big screen. And uh, what Jackson has done is uh, uh, focused in so you get close-ups of uh, film, which again you don't normally get in documentaries, and you see death uh, in all its uh, what, all its visceral brutality. You see uh, the blood stains. You see the destroyed bodies. You see the mangled limbs. You see the faces shot away, and these are uh, images that we have not seen before and and they are shocking and they are horrifying in their intensity and also it makes you think about uh, the horror of war and the horror of the first world war now i said at the beginning that it's uh, uh, an unqualified masterpiece but i do actually want to uh, qualify that in in just a slight way the opening uh, 20 minutes are what you might call normal uh, black and white film of uh, uh, British life before the war and then the, the build up to war with a lot of soldiers talking about how they were 15 or 16 when they joined up and they lied about their ages and that is very powerful. But I did find that that opening sequence which goes on for about 20 minutes, I, I, I thought it dragged a little uh, partly, I suppose, because from what I'd read about the film, I, I was expecting it to be all colourised, and that section isn't. And the last 15 minutes of the film are also go back to, to black and white. Now, uh, I, I saw it at Dulwich Picture House on, our, on the premiere, where it was a live uh, broadcast of a Q&A session with Peter Jackson after the film was shown at the British Film Institute. And Mark Commode interviewed him and, uh, and asked him a few questions. I would have liked him 
to have asked why uh, the opening sequence and the end sequence are uh, normal sort of black and white First World War film. And then the uh, middle or, or the, the vast bulk of the film is then the, the colorized new film, as it were. Now, I imagine that the reason that Jackson did that was so that the transition from the old black and white film that you're used to, to the new colorized uh, shocking film, is that much more shocking because it changes pretty much as the soldiers arrive at the front and start their their training so uh it it fades out if you like the old black and white film and then suddenly you are hit with this colorized version now i assume that's the reason peter jackson did it and and if that's why he did it i can see that and and it does work but i i was curious as to know why he had done it in that in that particular way now, the other thing I want to say about the film, this is not a criticism of the film, by the way, uh, and you may well find these comments quite controversial. Being retired, uh, I have on occasion watched the Jeremy Kyle show, and I'm sure you're familiar with what the Jeremy Kyle show is. But two of the things that stand out for me about the people who go on the Jeremy Kyle show is, first of all, they're, they're always dressed in slobby clothes. They're not a criticism, that's how they choose to be. But the other thing, and this is really noticeable, they have dreadful teeth. The vast number of, of guests, I suppose you'd describe them, have very poor teeth and very few teeth. Now, uh, don't get me wrong, I don't have a great set of gnashers myself, but, you know, I've got most of them. And the thing that hit me about the sequences showing the close-ups, and you do see close-ups, of the soldiers from the First World War, is that they all have appalling teeth. And it's the soldiers that you see not the officers. So it's difficult to tell whether the officers have dreadful teeth. One assumes that they don't. And the reason one imagines is that the vast majority of the soldiers were poor people with a poor diet, with no dental care, and they had bad teeth when they went into the army. They had a dreadful diet while they were in the army and their feet, their teeth simply rotted and fell out of their mouths. And that, to me, is, was one of the, the striking things. The other striking thing I mentioned earlier was about the number of people on the soundtrack describing how they were 15 or 16 when they joined up. Uh, there were also scenes where uh, German soldiers are, are captured and many of them are injured and the uh, medics treat the German soldiers uh, in the same way as they treat the British soldiers. And many of the soldiers talking on the film describe their, not, not sympathy for the German soldiers, but their, the awareness that they had that these German soldiers were just ordinary people like them uh, pushed into a war that they didn't necessarily understand and they didn't necessarily want to be. Although one should uh, uh, say that many of the soldiers describe how they enjoyed uh, the experience of the, the war, how it was um, life-giving for those who survived. And let us face uh, or, or let us uh, accept the people that you hear on the soundtrack are the ones who survived. And Peter Jackson makes this comment very poignantly uh, in his uh, Q&A session after the live screening. And that when you see uh, a group of soldiers in the trench prior to going over the top, those soldiers were subsequently virtually all blown to pieces. And that uh, is another one of the images that, that stays with you. Now, uh, again, not a criticism of the film itself, but I, I feel that one should talk a little about the First World War. I am going to talk a little about the First World War. To me, uh, the Second War 
was a justified war, it was a necessary war. And uh, fighting to defeat Hitler was the right thing to do. The first war, however, in, again, my humble opinion, uh, was a war of empires. Uh, it was a war of imperialism. It was a war of capitalism. And it was a war of royalty. It was about the royal houses of Europe fighting each other through the medium of a million working class soldiers sent to their deaths. It was not a noble war and although there is a tendency I think to look back on the First World War uh, and see it as a kind of romantic time, uh, a romantic war in some respects, uh, we should not blind ourselves to the reality of what this war was about and what or, or why it was fought. So, so we must uh, laud what uh, Peter Jackson has done and we must applaud what the Imperial War Museum did in uh, asking Peter Jackson to uh, look at this film and make something of it while recognising that the First World War has some uh, issues surrounding it. Let's, let's leave that there. Um, the, the other point I wanted to make about the film is that it's in 3D. So you have to wear 3D glasses, obviously. Now, 3D to me is a technology that uh, it, everybody thought was going to be the future and, and it hasn't really gone anywhere. And I wonder why Peter Jackson has done this, because it will affect the... Well, I, I assume he's made a two-dimensional version, uh, because that's what often happens. Um, yes, it, it perhaps gains something in 3D, but it loses something when you have to wear the glasses. But leave that aside. As far as this film is concerned, beg, borrow steal or preferably buy a ticket go and see it at the big screen and learn something about the first world war applaud the technology that peter jackson is employed to make this film and use it as a way of remembering and honoring those people who were killed uh, I mentioned at the beginning about a podcast and podcasts are coming soon. Keep a look out for them and I'll probably do a video of, I'm not sure you can do an unboxing of a podcast, but I'll do something anyway. See you next time.